Thank you for the invitation, Martin. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I will try to rush through a long presentation. I already referred to this issue, and most of you were here, so I will go quickly. I will just say that a new kind of equality is possible today, which is not income equality, but is equality of quality of life, especially for children, and the basic principle of democracy, which is that all citizens are equal before the law, which is not just poetry, it has very powerful implications. If all citizens are equal before the law, for example, a bus with 80 passengers has a right to 80 times more road space than a car with one. And there is another consequence of that, which is that a public good prevails over private interest. This is a very powerful principle. If public good prevails over private interest, for example, a country club with golf courses in the middle of a city with few parks should be turned into a park. Or there should not be private waterfronts. Uh, but let's go. I was asked to refer to transport. Transport is a fascinating issue. But can we talk about transport without knowing what kind of city we want? I don't think it's possible because before we know what kind of transport system we propose, we have to know what kind of city we want. It's very different if what we want is Houston than if what we want is Amsterdam. So, but even before we know what kind of city we want, we really have to know how do we want to live because a city is only a means to a way of life. A city is only a means to a way of life. So when we are designing, we are choosing a city model where we are choosing is a way of life. What kind of life will make us happier? So clearly, when we start talking about transport, it seems that we're going to go into engineering and it goes into something much more profound and more human than that and more political than that. Now, I love this picture of planet Earth because when we see this, we realize we are all uh, passengers on spaceship Earth and we really float in a self-sufficient spaceship with an unknown destination. And then we really feel so close together, the Chinese, the Colombians, the Americans. Uh, and then we come down here and then we realize we are not so close together after all. Uh, especially, for example, if you are a Colombian, it's so difficult to get a visa to anywhere in the world. They don't give you permission. It's very difficult. Uh, so, in fact, out of the whole planet, you only have a right to be within the borders of your own country. They may give you permission to go somewhere else, but that's only a kind, generous permission. You don't have a right to be anywhere else except in your own country. But then even in your own country, most property, property is private, so you cannot go into it because it belongs to other people. You cannot, I mean, some civilized countries, such as the Scandinavian countries, allow you to go into private property. But in Colombia, if you go into somebody else's private property, or in the United States, you may get killed. And you go into your city, into your city, and end in your city, you realize that in, in buildings, the same thing. You go into buildings where it's not your own property, and you can get killed. And you go into the streets, and you also get killed. So all this long story, just to emphasize something, out of the whole planet, out of the whole universe, the only microscopic piece to which we have access is public pedestrian space in our city. It's an extremely important part of the planet, public pedestrian space in our city. What is a good city? I mean, I, 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 I think clearly, uh, I love Jan Gell's definition of a good city where uh, people want to be out in public pedestrian space. But we don't really have so clear what a good city is. After so many shows of uh, animal planet and so, it is much clearer to us what the ideal environment is for a happy gorilla than what ideal environment is for a happy child. It's, we are far from knowing what really is, and I will try to propose that the cities that we have now are completely wrong. It cannot be right that we grow in fear of getting killed. We need things such as the following. We need to walk. And riding a bicycle is almost a more efficient way of walking. We need to be with people. We need public spaces, but with people. We need contact with nature. We need not to feel inferior 
in order to feel well. Public spaces were rich and poor meat as equals. We could survive in an apartment, the same way a bird survives inside a cage. But we suspect the bird would be happier in a cage as big as this auditorium and happier still flying free. In the same way, we are much happier if we have a 10 meter wide sidewalk than if we have a two meter wide sidewalk. But this is not something that can be proven. It's something that has to do with our heart. We feel it in our heart, in our soul. It's more like art than like engineering. I, much things about cities have to be decided by government in the end, but in a very subjective way. How high should buildings be? How wide should sidewalks be? How many parks should there be? Here, the mayor of Tuningen told us this morning, in this new development in, in, in Tuningen, only people can walk only three minutes uh, to reach a park. How far should people live from parks? We need to walk and we need to see people. Public spaces with people. Not, and I will refer to this in, in the outskirts of Prague, many buildings with lots of public space, but nothing around them, like the moon. We need contact with nature. I would say that what is good for vulnerable citizens, such as children or the elderly, the handicapped, is good for everybody else. We could design a city for children. Children and the elderly by themselves in public space are almost an indicator species of what a good city is. The same way that if we find there are trout in a mountain stream, this is an indication that the water is clean and has a lot of oxygen because trout are very demanding in, in terms of oxygen. So I would say if we find children by themselves in a city, this is a good indication that it's a good city. But Unfortunately, today, we tell any three-year-old anywhere in the world, world, they are barely learning to speak, and we tell them, watch out, a car, and the child will jump in fright. And with a good reason, because there are tens of thousands of children killed by cars every year in the world. But what is most amazing is not that this happens, but that we think this is normal. Today, we still talk of wolves. Wolves, because in Europe, during the Middle Ages, a few wolves ate a few children. So we tell wolves. And it's, but I can assure you, I would suspect that all through the Middle Ages, there were less children killed and eaten by wolves in Europe than are killed by cars on any given month today in the world. But what is shocking, again, is that we think this is normal. We think this, after 5,000 years of making cities, this is normal, to grow in fear of getting killed. This was not always like this, like in China, this Chinese old city, of course not on a bicycle, perhaps this is Tokyo in the Middle Ages. Any child could walk for blocks without any fear of getting killed. Or do you see how advanced it is? Sometimes we think before car cities were, no, like Prague, before cars. I mean, it was an extremely rich and civilized city, or, or, or Berlin, uh, or Paris, extremely sophisticated city. Even without cars, there was music, there was art, there was science. New York, 1905. So, I think the 20th century will be remembered as a disastrous one in urban history. We really made a mess. We made a huge mistake, and it will take us maybe one or two or 300 years to repair what we did. I think people will say in 200 years, how could people live in those horrible 2013 uh, cities? The same way today we say London was horrible in 1800. Yet, in 1800, London was the most admired city in the world, and everybody thought it was perfect. Now, this is some interesting numbers in a wonderful book by this guy, Peter Norton. Uh, in, in the United States, of course, there were no people killed by cars before 1900. But in the 1920s, motor vehicle accidents in the United States killed more than 200,000 people. In 1925 alone, more than 7,000 children were killed. And then, we had made cities for people with streets for people for 5,000 years. And when cars appeared, we should have made something completely different. No, we continued to do the same as if nothing had happened. We just made streets bigger, up to making giant highways. But basically, we continued to make the same buildings facing streets with cars, where cars kill people, as if nothing had happened, and we think this is wonderful, everything had gone on, the same thing as if nothing had happened. I think this is a huge mistake. Now, 
Of course, we have been realizing we made a mess. We made mistakes, so we have been pedestrianizing streets. Prague is an example of this all over the place. Uh, pedestrian streets in uh, Manhattan, they took away the, I understand Janet Sadikan was here last year. Uh, and here, of course, we have Alex. They did wonderful things like taking half the street space from Broadway away. This is the tendency. But I would propose, you know, I'd like to remind you of something. 80% 80% of the cities that will exist in 2050, 80% has not yet been built. So we could do something completely different. And if we had a magic wand, how do we want to do the same that we have been doing? Now, again, Manhattan. Now, I would emphasize that quality sidewalks are the most important element of a democratic city's infrastructure. It's not highways or it's not subways, it's quality side. That's what really makes a difference between advanced and backward cities. This, what this shows is that these citizens walking are third class citizens. The people in car are first class citizens. This is what this picture shows. What this picture shows is lack of democracy. This is not hard to find this picture. Anywhere in the developing world, you'll find thousands of pictures like this. You know, they build these horrible flyovers in Chennai, and they forget to boot sidewalks. You know? Of course, they are useless here, but also, by the way. Not even children are more important than parked cars. China is a disaster, even though it has advanced, you know. But here is Prague. You know? Bogota is a mess, a disaster. It was a disaster. When I became mayor, it was a war to build this, to make. It was, people tell me, told me, mayor, you are so stubborn because there is enough space in sidewalks to make sidewalks as well as to park cars right next to them or a, on a parking bay. So we had to have a TV commercial saying, look, we tend to assume that Sidewalks are relatives of streets because they live next to each other. However, sidewalks different from streets are not for getting from one place to another. Sidewalks are for talking, for playing, for doing business, for kissing. Sidewalks really are much closer relatives of parks or plazas than they are of streets. And to say that, in a, that a sidewalk is wide enough and that we could still have place for park cars, is equally absurd as to say that we could turn the main plaza or the main park in a city into an open-air parking lot so long as we leave enough space between cars for people to walk by. It was a war. I used to have my hair black before that. Now it's because I'm old, but at that time it wasn't because, no. Extremely difficult to get tens of thousands. When I got to be mayor of Bogota, maybe there was not one street where you could go in a wheelchair from one corner to the other in a street. This is, I'd like just to point very quickly, this, the blue shows negative image. You are disagree with or approve. So here is my term as mayor. You see here, I had 77% negative image. I was public enemy number one. You know, <laughs> extremely painful. I even had to send my, my little daughter to, uh, to 11 at that time to live in Canada with a brother of mine because it was, it was really difficult. I mean, it was, it was a war to get cars. And, but happily, when I finished my term, I had the highest positive image a mayor has ever had in the city, in Bogota. So what I say is worth sometimes to give battles. And of course, in more or less degree, Every mayor in the world who has fought to take space away from cars to give to people has had difficult times. Maybe not as much, but anyway. So that's the kind of things that we did, and this is the sidewalks that we built. As big, how big should they be? As big as possible, uh, you know? Anyway, ideally sidewalks should continue at grade at all intersections in all cities because it should be clear that it's cars that are going through pedestrian space and not the opposite. Pedestrians going through car space because the city is people's city.
wonderful big sidewalks, that's what we need everywhere in the planet. That itself would just change cities completely. Of course, it's not just wide, width. It has shops and windows and other things we'll talk about a little later. I, will, I have a, 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 a machine for most developing countries planning. It would be wonderful. Just a three, wheel, three people wheelchair where you have some chains and a little electric engine. You would see the mayor in the left, the head of planning on the right, and then the youngest child of them in the middle, and then have them go around to see how well they do. But now let's think of something different. How would your life change and improve if we would have a 100 kilometer long pedestrian and bicycle promenade only, a few blocks from your home, just bicycles and pedestrians, 100 kilometer long? How about a city with hundreds of kilometers of roads only for pedestrians and bicycles. We were able to do some experiments, and like, by the way, Bogota is an 8 million inhabitant city and one of the most dense cities in the world. We have about 210 inhabitants per hectare, extremely high. And still, this is in Germany. This is what you can do. But imagine hundreds, you could go across Prague through these bicycle highways. Now we did this in Bogota, where the city was growing, where it's very easy to do in India or in Africa or anywhere. We did 70 kilometers of pedestrian and bicycle only highways. Even fancy in a poor city with underground cables. This is, the city of course grew on top of this as you will see very soon. This is a very small example of what I think should be all over the world in cities. But thousands of kilometers of this. Of course, the architects here, with all the respect, here the architects who build these buildings, I think they found, they found their, their diploma inside a tamal, you know, because <laughs> they should have put the windows in, on, on front of here, you know, and they, they, but in time they will change. They were not yet used to these kind of things. Uh, this is, see how the city begins to grow around the bicycle highway. And look, this is an illegal neighborhood, the typical illegal. So we first, we did the space for pedestrians and then the cars later, we'll pay later. But first, we are showing respect for human dignity. We're trying to show that citizens without a car are equally important to those who have a car. Look at this picture. This is the pedestrian, the bicycle way, a park, and the cars in the mud. Of course, I would love to pave the street for the cars as well, but if I have only money for one thing, we do first the pedestrian. We are trying to construct equality, respect for human dignity first. Of course, in those neighborhoods, most people don't have cars anyway. <laughs> but never had this been done, even though this was the case. A lot of bikeways, bike, bicycle shops begin to appear alongside these bicycle highways, of course, all over the place. The more modern city begins to grow around it. You know, schools that we build, we build these schools, uh, children, uh, community centers, a lot of investment. All these neighbors, we did not put pavement in the streets. Sewage and water, great schools, uh, even indoor swimming pool, because Bogota is, by the way, very high up in the mountain, 2,600 meters, so it's cool, despite we are in the equator. Uh, so tens of thousands of people use this uh, every day now. Now, let's go quickly. The new city could be crisscrossed by hundreds and thousands. Children in the new city that I dream about, the ones you will help design in China, India, everywhere, could walk, would walk out into pedestrian spaces, networks of hundreds of miles long of greenways and bicycle highways. Imagine this was a park, 100 mile long park, that you would walk out into this. Buildings in the other side as well into greenways that would crisscross hundreds of kilometers like this. Every other street, let's imagine a city like this. One street for pedestrian, the next for cars. One for pedestrian only and bicycle, one for cars. One, very simple. I'm not proposing a rocket science or anything. It's political decision and it's so easy to do when you are designing new cities. Very easy. Japanese proposed, the Japanese proposed to us that we did a, where there was a creek, an eight-lane highway, and instead we did, again, a greenway, about 
35 kilometer greenway going from some of the poorest to some of the richest neighborhoods in the city, linking. This is uh, what we did. Now, bicycling. How about Prague? Why don't we take one of the main arteries of Prague, two lanes, two full lanes away, and make it a bicycle highway? Waterfronts. Let's go into waterfronts now. Waterfronts, I, why do I talk waterfronts? Because we don't have waterfronts. And I envy your rivers and your beautiful waterfronts. Because waterfronts are magic, you know? In the past, waterfronts, when cities were created around rivers, they were the bad parts of the city because they were smelly. The sewage would come into the waterfront. It was bad parts. And as soon as we were able to get rid of the sewage, we put highways. So, and only later, I mean, until very recently, in France, in Paris, Mr. Pompidou, in 1960, he put a highway next to the river. Now everybody realizes this is very stupid and we should not do it. But engineers love to put roads next to waterfronts because there is no intersections. You know, so only where you have a bridge, you have an intersection, the rest. And if you need some more space, you just infill a little bit of the river and you put the road there. But now we realize, of course, this is a very bad mistake. I'm going, this is the road Mr. Pompidou made. Of course, we all know how the people in Paris, they close it as often as possible. They close it for every summer for the Paris beach, uh, the Paris plage, and, uh, and of course, but this is in, in also, look at this water from this. They, in Korea, they invested billions of dollars to demolish this highway because they had this creek. Not they had the river, they had this. And they loved it so much they elected the mayor, the president of Korea. In Boston, they invested $23 billion to demolish these highways and put them on the ground because they were in front of the water. Let's go quickly, quickly, quickly. I'm just going to, but let's see. This is London's waterfront with cars. This is without cars. I mean, clearly, this is a fine waterfront, you know, it has, uh, uh, it has a sidewalk and all that. But clearly, it would be much better if we had buildings here and the road behind. New York, wonderful waterfront in, some si in one side, the other side is horrible highway. Buildings, pedestrian space, and the road behind. Again, again, of course, Venice, wonderful, and, and San Sebastián. Look at this, is San Sebastián in Spain. You see, there was a road here, like you have here in Prague. They turned into a pedestrian street. They got rid of the cars, and so they are in front of the beach now. The same thing that perhaps could be done here. You have some wonderful waterfronts, of course. Others not so wonderful. But in Bogota... We do not have a large river. I wish we had a river like yours. So we have only drainage canals. And still we put pedestrian spaces and people oil. Look what you can do with a drainage canal. Just some rainwater, you know, with some architecture and a little pedestrian space. It changes the life of people in a low-income neighborhood. Now, shopping malls. When shopping malls replace, as I mentioned before, Pedestrian space as a meeting place for people, this is a symptom that a city is ill. And this is happening here too. <laughs> Shopping malls, people don't go to shop, to buy actually. They just go to take a walk around, to have a coffee, to have ice cream, to bring the grandfather uh, in a wheelchair. Uh, it's different than a big shop where you just go and buy things, you know. And so you can see the building, the, this is the modern Prague where there is nothing to do around. No, no play. The measure of quality of a city is if it's nice to walk around. Nobody wants to walk around here, it's too boring. So all of these people, what they do is they go walk in the mall. They never want, they only walk here to go down to their car. I mean, income inequality is felt during leisure time. During wartime, the poor or the rich are more or less equally satisfied. It's when they go into a leisure time that the upper income person goes to a large house, large garden, uh, vacations, cultural activities, restaurants, and the poor people person goes to a very small house, and the only alternative they have for their, to television is public pedestrian space. Therefore, the least of the least that a democratic society should have is quality public pedestrian space, sidewalks, parks, sports facilities, 
public space is different from other public goods because it's not a means. It's an end in itself. It makes people happy. It's magical. I mean, it's, it's like magic. If you, you can, if, you, if, you go, if we go buy something in the shop, it gives us less and less pleasure as, as time goes by. Public pedestrian space is magic. You can look at it 20 times a day, go walk in it 50 times a day, and still it will always make you happy. It's magic. It doesn't lose its capacity to provide joy. Now, bicycles. Bicycles are a serious matter, but they need infrastructure. I wish I had I did a wonderful ride today. And they also have bad weather in the Netherlands, like in Prague, or in Denmark. They, you can even flirt. You don't need a Ferrari. You can flirt on a bicycle, even though she doesn't pay attention. That's tough, you know. <laughs> we try as our best. Anyway, in Bogota, we built more than 300 kilometers of bikeways when this was not in vogue. Before there were any bikeways in London or in Madrid or in Paris, and now we still only have like 500, and this was a revolution. But again, we still have some. We went from zero to 6% of people using bicycles, so very little still. But for every three people who use a car, one uses a bicycle, which is significant. So bicycles create equality again. A protected white... Why are bicycles so important in our country? Not just because they protect cyclists. It's because they increase the social status of the cyclist. They are a symbol of equality. It shows that a citizen on a $30 bicycle is equally important to one on a $30,000 car. So people before, they were ashamed of using a car. So once the bicycle infrastructure is wonderful, people feel more comfortable. Even in an advanced country, some people who would normally be ashamed to use the bicycle, if you have a fantastic bicycle infrastructure, they feel it's okay. He feels very proud of himself, for example. <laughs> now, but highways go in the shortest way from A to B. And usually, they, people who design for bikeways, they made them go all around as if they were just going having for a ride, for a fun, not for transportation. So we need straight bikeways, the same as for cars, the straight as a highway. We cannot make bicyclists go around like if they had all the time in the world. My question is, today we know that sidewalks are a right. I am sure in an advanced country such as a Czech Republic, if somebody gets hit by a car in a place where there is not a sidewalk, they will sue government and will probably get a lot of money. Because everybody knows, assumes that having a sidewalk is a right. You have a right to walk without the risk of getting killed. My question is, are bikeways, protected bicycles, just a cute architectural feature? Or are they a right? I would say it's a right because the only means of individual mobility to many people, for children, for example, is a bicycle. And we cannot assume that only those with motor vehicles have a right to mobility without the risk of getting killed. So I would be very happy the first time in a country, somebody in a bicycle who gets hit by a car in a place where there is not a protected bicycle ways should sue government and get a lot of money from government because he had the right or she had the right to a protected bicycle way in every street. Now, most cities in the world give more space to park cars than to sidewalks, than to space for pedestrians. Did anybody vote on this? Children have the same right to road space than somebody with a car. Who decided that this should be this way? Why not get rid of these parked cars and make bigger sidewalks? Why not let's go vote? And should we allow even children to vote on this? It's important to remember that parking is not a constitutional right in any country. So if government gets rid of parking somewhere and some people who are parking there go and they say, Mayor, where will I park now? The mayor can tell them. Well, it's as if you tell me that where you should put your clothes or your food. This is not my problem. Put it anywhere you want. You know, this is, you know, this is not an obligation by the state to provide you parking, you know. 
Government has many obligations, has to provide education, health, housing, jobs, but no parking, not yet, anywhere that I know of. Now, in Bogota every Sunday, we close 120 kilometers of main roads during seven hours. This I did not do, we increased a lot. This is a tradition we have been increasing. I doubled the length, but this is, we get 1.7 million people in the streets, main arteries, during seven hours every Sunday. This is what you call a car-free day in Europe, but we have a real car-free day I will tell you about. <laughs> uh, we voted. I invited people to vote on a referendum, so people voted. And we have the first Thursday of every February, no cars in Bogota. And the amazing thing is that this 8 million inhabitant city, of course we have taxis and buses and trucks. The idea is that the city works. And everybody goes to work as if nothing had happened. We also asked people in that referendum if they wanted to have totally ban cars during peak hours in the morning and peak hours in the afternoon every day beginning the year 2015. And there was a huge campaign by some business interest. Not for people to vote no, because we were going to win by far the elections. So for people not to vote, because we needed to have more than 33.3% of voters' participation. And we missed it by one per 1,000. But this one got approved. So we have a car-free day every year in Bogota. It's an interesting exercise. Transport is a peculiar problem because it tends to get worse as people, as society gets richer. It's different from health or education. As, we, as societies get richer, health gets better, education gets better, but traffic jams get worse. We have to understand why in the United States, every city has been getting worse traffic jams every year for the last 40 years despite big highways everywhere. Why? This is very important because what creates traffic is not the number of cars. It's the, num it's the number of trips and the length of trips. For example, one car, for example, 10 cars that go for one kilometer each create the same traffic as one car that goes for 10 kilometers. Do we agree? So when we make bigger roads, people just do more trips and longer trips. And so we never, ever have solved traffic with making bigger highways, such as this now. Highways never, but high velocity roads are like fences in a cow pasture. They destroy quality of life. They restrict, limit our freedom. They dis high velocity roads lower real estate values all around them. They are like cancer for urban areas, you know? Like here, this is a highway here. You know, all around it, prices go down. Nobody wants to live near and next to them. This is an interesting thing I'd like to know. In Manhattan, here we have the biggest expert here sitting in front, but one thing that is very interesting, in the east, east side of Manhattan, we have a horrible highway destroying the waterfront called the FDR Highway, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Highway. In the right side, we have more of an avenue, a boulevard with traffic lights, with a park, a greenway, a sidewalks, buildings. The amazing thing is that the Avenue moves 80% of the cars that the highway moves. And in developing countries where highways get jammed, it's even the same. So, avenues move all, look, this is the famous Champs Elysees, one of the most famous avenues in the world. It has eight car lanes, eight. It's a highway almost, except it has traffic lights, it has sidewalks. So instead of destroying value, destroying quality of life, it increases quality of life, increases the quality of the city. So we should never have highways anywhere near cities, never. We should have roads with big sidewalks, trees, shops, ideally traffic lights, well synchronized, and we'll move practically the same amount of cars, but we will not destroy the city. We will not make these horrible rivers for cars. So look, look at the sidewalks in this Champs Elysees. So this is one of the, most, the best pedestrian spaces in the world. And it's next to a giant road for cars. So let's never make highways anymore. This is crazy. An avenue or boulevard, whatever you want to call it, moves almost the same amount of cars, and it does not do damage to the city in the way that the highway does. Again, Chan said, you see the kind of buildings you see. It's a lot of valuable buildings next to the road. It's not like this highway, which is like a no man's land. We have expensive restaurants. I mean, now, why do people, why do 
rich people use public transport in New York or Zurich? It's because they love public transport in New York, you know? It's so horribly hot. It's giant rats in this subway, you know? Never electric escalators, nothing. So why do they go in there? Because they have to. <laughs> because it's very difficult to move by car. There is no way to play to Woody Park. It's a slow. So you, if you want people to use public transport, you have to use to have good public transport on one hand, but on the other hand, to, it's the carrot and the stick to restrict car use. And the most obvious way to restrict car use is restrict parking. The most obvious way. It's important to understand mobility and traffic jams. Public transport will solve mobility, but it will not solve traffic jams. You can have a subway under every street, and you will not solve traffic jams. The only thing that will solve traffic jams is restrictions to car use. We don't have time to go, like in, but things like now. Let's go quickly. I will be... I, why should we put people on? I mean, I know you love your subway. Subways are wonderful. And of course, in some cities like old Prague, the only way to go across is with a subway. We cannot do anything else. But in general, I prefer to be in the surface. Why go underground like a rat? I prefer much better. So buses with exclusive lanes or trams with exclusive lanes, because I have been in trams in Prague which are in traffic. So it's... Now, this is a subway in Washington. By the way, the escalator was broken then, you know? It's much nicer to be above ground on a bus or a tram with exclusive lanes, seeing the trees, seeing the city. We, for example, in Guangzhou, this system that uh, was done there, it moves more passengers our direction than all subway lines in China. All subway lines in China. Our system, bus system, moves more passengers our direction than all subway lines in the world, except for three or four. And at a fraction of the cost, at a fraction of the cost. But also it's a very beautiful democratic symbol because it shows while the cars, which may be $100,000 worth or whatever, is stuck in traffic jam, the public transport goes by zooming by. So it's a picture of democracy at work. It shows that it is really true that public good prevails over private interest. Of course, I will go quickly because here traffic is not, but I will tell you. Seven, I don't know how is the vote for women in Czech Republic, but in the United States, for example, or in Colombia, 70 years ago, women could not vote. Many times we have injustice before our noses. 70 years ago, a black person had to give up their seat to a white person in a bus in the United States. Today, when we talk about the French Revolution, we say, oh, it's so obvious what changed in the French Revolution. But it was not so obvious because a thousand years had gone by and nothing had changed. So sometimes injustice is before our noses and we do not see it. In my opinion, to have a bus in traffic is as absurd as having women not vote. Because clearly, anywhere there is traffic, buses should have exclusive lanes or trams. This is basic democracy. I would say that it doesn't take PhDs from MIT. At committee with 12-year-old children, we realize in 20 minutes that the most efficient way to use scarce road space is exclusive lanes for buses. And is the, for the developing world, let me tell you, London, London has the longest subway in the world. And still, they move one million more people by bus than by subway. An underground subway can cost up to $250 million per kilometer. So the developing world, the only possibility they have to solve mobility, mass transit, is with bus-based systems. Even trams are too expensive. Let's go quickly. Quickly, quickly, because I don't have time into this. I like this. This is here in Prague from the plane, the, sub, the tram going in the middle. Of course, here is not much traffic problems, but... This is nice, but then later they get into traffic. Now, now road, space, road space is a city's most valuable resource. Road space is a city's more valuable. We could find diamonds under Prague or oil. It's not as valuable as the space between buildings, as Gail calls them. How should we distribute this space between pedestrians, bicycles, 
public transport, and cars. All I like to tell you, I, don't, I will not tell you how you should distribute it. All I like to tell you, this is a political decision. This is not a technical decision. You can give cars all the space you want, and still there will be traffic jams. So, for example, we could begin by getting rid of parking, by, of street parking. For example, it's interesting to, rem to know that, for example, in London, in central London, all the buildings, in office buildings in central London, they do not, do, do not have parking. No parking is allowed. For example, you architects, all of you must know the famous Gherkin of Norman Foster. Zero parking. They have two or three for handicaps. Now, again, this is a picture in London. See more space for pedestrians than for cars. What I like to emphasize, I don't know what you want to do, is this is a political decision. There is nothing technical about it. It's ideology. Let's go quickly because I don't have time. But we could also have a city. Imagine a new city. When you are going as advisors to the governments in Asia and Africa, I suggest the following with all respect. Why not propose thousands of kilometers of roads for buses only? In these new cities where you are going to build, it'd be so easy to do it. Cost nothing, and it works like a subway. Very low cost, works beautifully. Why not? In Bogota, for example, when we were putting our bus system, we went downtown. And so some people said, oh, the road is too narrow, so we cannot put the bus system there. So we said, yes, you're right, the road is too narrow. But since we are in a democracy, what we cannot have there is cars. So out cars, only buses, <laughs> you know? But this is, but the important thing, the, the, <laughs> the important issue is the dream for the future. That's the important thing. Why not design cities from the start? with hundreds of kilometers of roads only for buses. It would be so easy. I mean, you would have the road only for buses, and then behind you would have the road for cars, of course. I'm not saying there should not be any cars. Like this, roads only for buses. This could be the future of cities, so easy. Buses, pedestrians, and bicycles. Of course, we will have roads for cars, too. I'm not saying that. Now. I think something I'd like to emphasize is what is most important, you architects, what is most important about a building is what happens when it reaches the ground. Many times there is a lot of discussion whether uh, social housing is too small or too big. I think much more important than whether it's big or small is where it's located and what the quality of public space is. Location and quality of public space. And another thing people discuss, how high should buildings be or not. I, it's not irrelevant, but much more important is what happens when the building reaches the ground. I think, with all due respect to architects, the price to any building should be given first of all because once a building is built, the public space around it becomes more attractive to be there, to walk there, to play there, to talk there. This is what the first criteria to judge whether a building is good or is bad. So. And I would not only say for public space. For example, this is a, you have a very famous Frank Gehry building. I think Frank Gehry has wonderful buildings, but in New York, this is a horrible building, you know? You walk, you cannot see what's happening inside. It's like a wall. This is not pleasurable to be there. With all due respect, I think he's a genius and all that, but this is very bad for the city. This is not what I would say is a, an example. I like, you know? This is nice. You have windows, you have people you would see from the inside to outside, you have shops. So this building, for example, in New York, is it three-story high or is it 30-story high? Who cares? The important thing is that it's a nice sidewalk, it has shops, so. Now, this is what I find in the new Prague. Who wants to walk there? I mean, but this is new and not so new, but I would like to say, I was shown city before communists, during communists, uh, late part of communists, uh, Velvet Revolution. If the most fantastic guys I had, they showed me many things, but all of them had very similar space around them. It's not places you like to walk around or to be there. Man, you have in Prague, you have in Prague, everybody looks to Prague all around the world. You know what works. What is it that makes a city function, be successful, attract billions of dollars in tourism? And then you go out and do exactly the opposite. I don't understand, but so, 
the, 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 mayor, the, the, the mayor of Tubingham this morning, and this is not just because he's new, the mayor of Tubingham this morning, I don't know if he left, but anyway, he showed a new project, a new project, which was completely into the, the it was new, five years or 10 years old, I understand, but it was with the same characteristics of the old city. I mean, this is desolate spaces. Nobody wants to be there. You just somehow you have to walk through there, but it's not because it's a pleasure to be there. You know, plazas or parks, the, the more important thing about a plaza or a park, a plaza or a park is not like a piece of art. In the plaza or the park, the more important part is the frame, what happens around it. It has to be framed. You know, it's not like, uh, not even the biggest billionaire can have a park. Because, I mean, Central Park is nothing without the buildings around it, the people. So it's at least as important, if not more, is what frames the park, what happens around, you know? So this is, it seems like desolate. This is from the plane landing here. So this is what you see in modern Prague, see? Who wants to walk around there? You know, it's just cars parked, some green, a lot of green, but somehow not really wonderful parts, but just sort of put green there somehow. You know, when you have the most amazing city in the world, everybody admires and loves here, when you could really do something similar to what you have here, where you want to walk in front of the buildings. This is with all due respect, I'm not an architect, so I can say crazy things without being, you know. But here, this is green, this is a completely wasted green. Maybe it's good for your dog to go and do <laughs> his needs, you know, but. I don't think many people will love to go there and do something, you know? It's, it's, it's. Even the new, which is cho shown, you know, for example, look, no windows, you have parked cars inside, no This is the new, wonderful new architecture in Prague, with all due respect, but I say, okay, maybe nice, but no windows in the first floor. So you are going to walk in front of a blind wall, it's not a pleasant experience, and then you have these uh, balconies, what are you going to look at? You know, when I open, I have this wonderful, I was given the, a loan, and I am staying at an apartment in downtown in front of a plaza in front of City Hall, and I open the window, I see people all the time, things happening, things. What are they going to look at from the balcony? What do you mean? You look at, a, so, now, again, you know, uh, I'm not an architect, so I'm not going to give you the solution, but it's you who have to solve it. But here is all Prague, see? Shops in the first floor, you know, people like to walk in front of them. I mean, it's nothing, you know, shops, cafes, things like this. Again, you know, you fancy buildings and all this, but it could be, you know, the same. Why not have the same in the new Prague? Close to public transport, narrow streets. Uh, I mean, blah, blah, blah. Let's go quickly. I'm finishing. Uh, <laughs> I would just say my recommendation is that a city, in every detail, in every little detail, a city should show two things. First, that human beings are sacred. And second, that human beings are equal. Thank you.